these were supposed to be 15 minutes. I didn't include a lot of information, so I just wanted to give people an idea of the type of work that we're doing. Um, I'm a plant pathologist, and we've got a lot of projects going on, but I thought the one that would be most relevant to this group was our work that we've been doing on uh, bitter rot and apple scamp of apples. And most of this work has been done by my PhD student, Matt Wallhead. I'm just here to um, claim the glory for the, his, <laughs> um, his hard work. So the one pathogen uh, that most of us in the Northeast are familiar with is Venturi inequalis, which causes um, apple scab. And this um, particular interaction is very interesting because the fungus has co-evolved with the host, apple, for thousands of years since its um, time and center of origin in Central Asia and likely Kazakhstan. And so the fungus has evolved that its, its ascospores mature at approximately the same time the, the apple tree's um, flowers start to bud. And so we have figured this, this figured this out as well. And so many of our current models have relied on our knowledge of the fact that the fungus will be ejecting its spores at the same time um, apple trees are getting ready to, um, to open up their flowers. And at that point, apple trees are also their most susceptible to this disease. And so almost all of our current spray models of apple scab are based on using a degree, a degree, um, degree day accumulation, so this is accumulation of temperatures, to 50% um, of MAC green tips. So that's when um, the, the tip of the flower bud is starting to swell and, and it's getting close to open. That means you also know that these ascospores are also getting mature. So we can see green tip really easy. You can't see mature ascospores so easy. We can, and we actually do that. We actually monitor these um, spores as they mature. And so we actually know when they're um, <clears throat> ready to eject. However, as, as we've observed, even in the last, you know, in, in the three years that I've been here, the erratic natures of our um, temperatures and rain patterns in the fall um, during green tip and flower. And trees are lucky, they have roots, they can get water from the soil, but this fungus won't eject its spores unless there's actually an active rainfall event to allow those spores to swell and then eject. So, um, well, many people will start spraying at green tip. If it is not raining at green tip, you don't need to spray. And this last year, we went an entire three weeks past green tip without a rain event, and that freaked a lot of people out because we were telling them you don't have to spray until it rains, but it's really hard to do when considering the potential damage an infection event can, can take place. So knowing that we have this change in how weather patterns are moving and how this affects um, how the ascospores are ejected into the canopy, we want to develop better predictive models, because basically many of our spray schedules now are based on this fact that when you're at green tip, you start the spray program, you either use a calendar spray program, or you simply wait for the weather, and the weatherman says, 70% oh, chance of rain tomorrow, so I get out and spray today, or do I hedge my bets, think it's not going to rain? Either way, you end up wasting a spray, or if you don't spray, then you open yourself up to an infection event. So there's a company over in the Netherlands that has developed this program called RIMPRO, and it's called it's um, an acronym for the Relative Infection Measure. And um, this is the website RIMPRO.be/USA. So we have a weather station at Kingman Farm, and our weather data is available, and this model is available to the public. You can just go and you can look at it. And what you can do is you can actually monitor the um, ascospore inoculum over the course of the season. So at the beginning of the season, you're at 100%. So you got 100% of your ascospores ready. Um, and what you're waiting for is a, these are wetness events. And wetness is not enough for the ascospores to eject. They actually need a rain event. And when you get a rain event, the program predicts a discharge of ascospores. And when you see those ascospores discharging, then you can actually get out and apply a, uh, a fungicide such as potassium bicarbonate and sulfur. And so potassium bicarbonate is just a food additive, almost uh, very similar to uh, baking soda. And we've known for a long time that it's fungitoxic. The problem is it's got a 24-hour window of activity. So people haven't used it because 
24 hours is just not enough time. But if you know exactly when ascospores are being discharged, you can actually go out and spray. And in Quebec and in Europe, they actually go out and spray in the rain if they have to, because that um, potassium bicarbonate prevents those spores from germinating. Then once the rain event finishes, you actually go out and put on another application of potassium bicarbonate um, to ensure you got all of those ascospores. Fortunately, potassium bicarbonate is a whole lot cheaper than most, uh, most fungicides currently being used. And then the program also predicts um, if the ascospores are being ejected right here, they will start um, germinating and infecting right here. And once they get here, game's over. They've infected, they've got into the leaves. Technically, they started including this. They're calling this their kickback, where if you apply a post-infection fungicide at that point, you can actually get protection back across that. I'm not recommending it because um, that will most certainly lead to fungicide resistance. Um, in the Midwest, I believe they've lost, they've lost just about every active ingredient that they put out, usually within a span of five to six years. So this is our weather data from Kingman Farm um, this, uh, this last scab season, mostly through May. And so if you remember, back here, we're at full ascospore potential on April 27th. And if you remember, does anybody got, have apples? Was watching the apples, green tip? By April 27th, they were at green tip. I think they were at pink, and they were getting ready to flower, and we're at full ascospore potential. But we were actually past flower when we got our first significant rain event on, on May 12th. And so, of course, you get this massive ejection of all of, those, all of those spores that you had. But we saw it coming, and so we went out and we were able to uh, put on our potassium bicarbonate and sulfur treatments. And then we had a couple of other rain and infection events. But overall, it was a fairly mild season. And had a grower been spraying based on this model, um, they could have used substantially fewer fungicide sprays and saved themselves um, quite a bit of money. So what we did, um, we were doing a standard Captan calendar-based spray. So starting at green tip, we were spraying every 10 days with Captan as a protective fungicide. Um, we also were actually spraying Captan um, using the RIMPRO model, as some people still aren't comfortable with the idea of using something like potassium bicarbonate. If you sprayed with Captan using our RIMPRO model, you would have used three fewer applications. And then with RIMPRO with potassium bicarbonate and sulfur, we made nine sprays. That generally includes a spray right at ascospore ejection and then a spray after the rain event has occurred. And so you spray more times, but potassium bicarbonate and sulfur is far less um, toxic than Captan, and it's a lot cheaper than Captan as well. And I think the end results came out pretty well. So um, on our untreated check trees, so these are, these are the trees, we just let them get scabbed. Um, they generally had five lesions per leaf. Um, and so we had fairly significant scab pressure in our orchard. And then um, the Captan calendar-based um, spray, the Captan RIMPRO, and the potassium bicarbonate were all fewer than one scab lesion um, per leaf. So using potassium bicarbonate with our RIMPRO model appears to work um, fairly well. Uh, so, in the future, we're trying to get more people interested in using this RIMPRO model. Right now, if you live in the Durham area and you are interested in using RIMPRO, you have access to that website. You can watch as our weather data is going and as our ASCA spores are ejecting. I'm not exactly sure what the range is outside of Durham, but it would be great to see a network of weather stations um, in New Hampshire and the Northeast and we could have everybody using all of this connected weather data to run, uh, to run RIMPRO. The other project we're working on is a disease called bitter rot. And this is a disease that has um, increased in prevalence in the Northeast. Um, and we believe that this may, a lot of this may have to do with climate change as well, as this is historically a more southern and mid-Atlantic apple disease. Um, but we've seen outbreaks in New Hampshire, in New York, and then last year there was a really bad outbreak in, in Ontario. Um, and so what we're trying to investigate is where is the disease inoculum coming from? Is it coming from in infected leaves, um, latent infections in the fruit, 
possibly other orchards, or possibly even other other fruit crops. So we've done some um, inoculation experiments looking at virulence of these um, different strains of this pathogen, as well as potential resistance in some of our different apple cultivars. And we just basically do a base, uh, puncture wound, and then we put the spores in there, and we, we watch the disease develop. And what we found is there isn't a whole lot of difference in virulence between the strains. It looks like the strains, whether they're coming from fruit, whether they're coming from leaves, even the ones that are coming from cherry, are all pathogenic on our apples. Um, what we did see is there is a difference in susceptibility, where Pioneer Mac is the most susceptible, and Mutsu and Honeycrisp appear to be slightly more resistant. However, I'm not sure about the reliability of our inoculation method, because there's been several cases of whole bins of Honeycrisp, going into the bin looking perfectly healthy, coming out a week later with bitter rot. And so we're worried about these late infections as well. We did, a, um, we did some field inoculations, looking at a couple of alternative compounds. Um, these are plant oil extracts, and this is captan. And um, so these bars represent the different, the different uh, fungicide treatments. And what we found is none of the fungicides really worked. But what we did find is that Mutsu um, appears to be much less susceptible to bitter rot than some of our other varieties. And again, Pioneer Mac is the most susceptible um, variety that we have. The other thing I just wanted to, to note without going into a long discussion on, on fungal phylogenetics is the fact that historically we've, we've talked up bitter rot being caused by a species called Colococcum acutatum. And this species also supposedly infects strawberries, peaches, um, peppers, any number of fruit. But recent phylogenetic studies, including the one that we did in my lab, indicates that there are multiple different species of fungi that used to be Colococcus acutatum. And the one that we have in the Northeast, and the one that we've primarily found in all of our apple orchards, is a, a species called Colococcus fiorinae. Um, and this is fairly new work, and so right now what we're, what, what we're currently doing is trying to extend our sample size and sample outside the Northeast and see what the distribution of this species is. And the implications of this is that all of our bitter rot management strategies have been based on this organism called Colococcum acutatum, but that's not what we actually have here. So the question is, is and most of those were developed for the mid-Atlantic and southern states, so the question is, are those things going to work for us? And so we're basically developing, developing new epidemiological studies for this particular organism, um, and then trying to understand its distribution, and also trying to understand if it infects more things than apple. So is the strain that infects strawberries the same one that infects apples? Is the one that infects blueberries the same one that infects apples? Um, and that's the importance of, of that phylogenetic study. We are also looking at the, the effect of these early season infections. And so Colococcum also has what we call an endophytic phase, so it can actually grow and live inside the plant without causing disease. And so we did this study last year where we actually inoculated the, um, the apple trees at flower with Colococcum spores. And what we found is that the apple did not develop disease until they were fully mature, but when they did develop trees, or when they developed disease on the trees that we inoculated flowers, 83% of the fruit had bitter rot versus a 5% level of disease in, in trees that were, were not inoculated, which is, that's, that's actually pretty high too, and I'm worried that we put so many spores into our orchard that it sort of got moved around. But we're working on this hypothesis that infection at flowering is the most important point of the year for preventing bitter rot. So this next year, we're actually going to be applying a fungicide treatment at flower as well to see if we can prevent infection um, by bitter rot. So that project is moving forward. So we're really moving into the second year of most of these studies to sort of verify the results we got in that first year, as well as expanding our work on Colatotricum, um, some of the basic biology and epidemiology of this fungus, and then trying to extend the range of 
of Renfro in the Northeast. So with that, I will take any questions. We'll hand over to the next presenter.